Hi, welcome back to another episode of Real World Serverless, a podcast where I speak with real world practitioners and get their stories from the trenches. Today, I'm joined by Ken Robbins. Hi, Ken. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Yeah, so I guess we met uh, virtually at the Serverless Days uh, virtual a while back, and I was really taken aback by the talk you gave at the conference. Um, maybe before we go into that, can you tell the audience about uh, yourself uh, and your journey into the world of serverless? Sure, absolutely. Well, let's see. By day, I am the founder of a startup called Cloud Pegboard. I guess I should say day, night, weekend. It's a startup. Uh, and this is a service that helps AWS developers keep up with the flood of uh, cloud information. Uh, and we do this by providing you know, personalized Slack or email feeds uh, for just the information that's relevant to you. We also have a, a portal uh, that makes development much easier and much more efficient by organizing all the reference information that you access in a comprehensive per service data sheets. Uh, and so Cloud Pegboard is right now a solo entrepreneurship. And so it's 100% strategically relying on serverless. Uh, which has really enabled me to get a ton of stuff done uh, with just me. It'd be great to have a team like I used to have, um, but you know, that's why serverless works there. Um, I do a couple other things. So um, I'm also the volunteer CTO of Miles for Migrants, as you mentioned. That was sort of the context that we first met. Uh, and, and there we use donated frequent flyer miles to fly people that are fleeing uh, war, persecution, disaster. We re- reunite them with their family or, or find other safe havens for them. Um, and again, so I'm a volunteer there. The organization is almost entirely volunteers. There's a, just a few staffers, uh, and I'm the only one that does any sort of development. And so, again, I strategically rely on serverless to get stuff done that um, otherwise just probably wouldn't get done if it had a higher um, buying cost. And uh, I guess also relevant to some of this is before I started Cloud Pegboard a year and a half ago, I ran engineering for Navaris Research and so sort of the joint discovery side of things. And... Uh, I moved us from a fully on-prem organization to the cloud uh, starting in 2015. And in the process, I onboarded over 500 individual uh, engineers and, and informaticians to our platform. Uh, and so there as well, there's a, you know, we used a lot of it as a hybrid strategy and, and we had a lot of different types of solutions, uh, but certainly uh, serverless was a strategic focus as well. You know, basically where we could use it, we did, and where, we, where it didn't make sense, we didn't. Okay, so that's quite a few different things we can unpack there. Um, I guess yeah. I want to start by talking about uh, Miles for Migrants, uh, seeing as a volunteer organization. And I guess the cost is a very much uh, the first and foremost uh, of your concerns uh, in terms of your time, in terms of resource use, but also in terms of the AWS bill as well. So what has been your experience of building Miles for Migrants uh, with serverless so far? Yeah, so I think the dominant factor is the amount of effort it takes to get from idea to solution. So cost is is important because you know, we really want any donation we get, which is mostly in miles and, and very little in cash, um, to be going to the, the heroes that we fly and the people that need it. Uh, and so we really, you know, obviously, like many charities, are, are on a shoestring there. But fortunately, I should mention uh, that AWS has been very generous to get us going and and we got some credits. And with serverless, I really don't put much of a dent into those. Um, But it's really mostly about the time, right? Um, It's kind of crazy slash dumb to be doing this work while trying to build a startup. But it's important to me. And and if I had higher costs, like if I had to start deploying a server and maintain things in that sense, it would be enough friction that I probably wouldn't do some of the things that we've done. And so the serverless makes it possible to basically build something, get it deployed quickly, and then really importantly is no maintenance. Because frankly, with an organization like this, sometimes people that volunteer, and my, I'm, I'm a risk as well, they get tied up in other things. And so they start, they build something, and, and then they disappear. So then if you got to figure out how they built the AMI and, and what the, how to patch it and how to tune various things, you know, just, just a lot of, you know, right? There's a lot of stuff that goes on there. And we're, with serverless, basically, I deploy stuff. It runs. It's all very self-documenting. I happen to use a serverless framework. And so basically, you can just do you know, serverless deploy to make a change, and it's it just requires zero maintenance and zero extra effort, which is really important because we can't really break operations just because we have some variation in, in who's working and who's volunteering or not. 
Okay, and how does the architecture for Mouse for Migrant look like from the back end? Uh, I can imagine there's going to be a lot of uh, API calls uh, where, I mean, how do people even contribute their miles uh, that have collected with different airlines and uh, I guess alliances and uh, contributed them to you? Yeah, so interestingly, you know, Cloud Pegboard has got a pretty complicated, um, not complicated, but expansive um, serverless infrastructure. By contrast, Miles for Migrants, it's really simple and in very independent sections of, of capabilities. The Really, the story is the idea of using serverless when I need it. So the, the first tier of serverless for us is to use SaaS. So in particular, we use uh, Salesforce.com as well as Jira for a couple of different aspects. And Basically, I'm using AWS and serverless when there are gaps or when I need to glue things together. So, for example, uh, we need to get some, do some analytics on our Jira. Uh, so I have a Lambda function that's you know, scheduled off a CloudWatch event, which wakes up, extracts all of our ticket information from Jira, puts it into S3 and then into um, you know, QuickSight, and then we can do some analytics. So that's, that's one example. And then another place, there is an app that you know, when we have uh, partners in the field, these are the people that work with refugees or asylum seekers, and they're in the situation where you know, they find someone quite literally just that's been dropped off at a bus stop and they just don't know what's going on and how to you know, find safe haven. And so volunteers from various organizations will find them and engage with them. And if they you know, eventually come to the point where they need to fly them somewhere. And so that's, they'll contact us. We'll, we'll match them up with a donor who's got some miles. Uh, but one of the things we need to do is get a signature from them. Uh, and so we have a very simple web-based mobile app that the partner can basically hand to the refugee or whatever um, displaced person is uh, and ask them to read the agreements, uh, fill in a few pieces of information and sign it with, you know, using a little finger signature. Uh, and this is all done in the field. And so what happens there is once they do that signature, we convert that into a, a PDF that has the agreement with the signature, and that has to get attached to the JIRA ticket, right? So that's not a capability I can do straight out of the box um, with Atlassian. Uh, so you know, basically, I just build a HTML JavaScript-based app, put together you know, a few Lambda functions in the back end to receive this, you know, to basically serve the page and, and then receive the submitted signature and, and document. And then there's another Lambda function that interacts you know, with the uh, Jira API. Uh, you know, so it's, it's things like that where it's just a small independent piece that stands up to be basically a lot of glue. Uh, but that one piece of glue, once I build it, I really never ever touch it again. It's, it's that stable. You know, and then there's some other places, for example, uh, where Jira via various plugins, you can call out to APIs. And so I can put together an API to serve up certain types of information. You know, one that um, it's actually not fully integrated yet because of an issue on the on the Jira plugin side. But for example, when we're filling out a form, one of our agents needs to be able to um, put in what location. So right now we have it in the um, you know the airport ID suggests you're typing in a free form text box. But obviously, I want that to be a a drop down pick list because we really don't want to have errors. Uh, errors are, are expensive in terms of the human cost if you have to go back and forth when this, you know, things are very really timely. So you know, being able to make an API call to do the autocomplete for SFO to be San Francisco and that sort of thing. So that's that kind of thing. Hopefully that kind of gives a picture of, for Miles for Migrants at least, a lot of pieces that are um, where we need a bit of glue, we just put together something that's a serverless solution and drop it in place. You mentioned that uh, at the start of that conversation there that uh, Cloud Pegboard is, has a much more expensive architecture. So what does the architecture for Cloud Pegboard uh, looks like? Sure. So there's probably three main sections, I would say. There's sort of the whole back-end data collection, integration, uh, and persistence. Then there's a front-end web app and then APIs to provide some data services to the web app. And then similar to that, but in parallel, is a Slack application that we have that's a, you know, a Slack bot uh, that, again, reaches back into the integrated data, but then serves that up as an application. So each of those is uh, also serverless, and the, the back end is maybe the more interesting part in, in the sense that there's uh, data collection doesn't have to be instantaneous, so it wakes up on a scheduled basis using, you know, again, a, a CloudWatch event. 
a scheduled event, I should say. And it kicks off a step function that runs in parallel a whole bunch of these data collectors. So um, there are literally dozens of them, and each one is an independent Lambda function that goes and collects data from different sources and then you know, puts it into S3. And then further on down the pipe, we have things that do integration and pulls all these S3 files together to integrate them. Uh, there's another sort of step in the step function that does you know, text differences so we can alert and what's changed with AWS, what's new, what's what's changed. Then there's something that kicks off to send emails to the users on a daily or weekly basis, depending on, on their preferences. And so all of that's being coordinated through a step function on the back end. Um, sure. Uh, so actually, with the step functions, uh, when you kicked off those uh, different parallel steps, what are the things that you're actually crawling? Are you crawling the AWS uh, blog, I guess, and then just collecting them based on different, uh, uh, I guess, different services? Is that what you're crawling? Yeah. So we pull in from several dozen RSS feeds, then also... Um, Sometimes we're hitting APIs, so I pull data from GitHub, from YouTube, from Twitter. Uh, so, for example, on Twitter, um, you, you know, um, the hashtag uh, uh, AWS wish lists that get you know tossed in there, which are, are pretty neat. But one of the things I do is that's one of my data sources. So I pull in AWS wish list items from Twitter, and then, like I do with all services, there's basically a step where when we integration after I pull data in. I scan it using different techniques. Sometimes I'm using Comprehend. Sometimes it's heuristic, depending on how structured or unstructured the data is, to basically just try to identify what AWS services is this data source talking about. Sometimes it's really obvious. Other times you have to, like on a wish list item, you have to extract that. And once I know that, I tag it with, you know, I have an immutable ID for all AWS services. Uh, and then we tag it with that so that Ultimately, most of the data that I deliver back to the user is organized by service. And that's sort of a pretty fundamental paradigm to organize data by service, since I think that's the way people tend to work. Like I'm working with DynamoDB at the moment. And so I care about its limits, its security URL, the Bodo you know, doc, the CloudFormation doc. And so all this information I pull together on, by service. And so um, and then sometimes they're HTML pages, sometimes they're APIs, so SSM. AWS uh, Services Manager, um, uh, System Services Manager. So I couldn't get those <laughs> that acronym out. Uh, you know, that's I. You know, for some information like region support, I pull directly from APIs there. So it's really quite a variety. And so what's really neat is every time I identify a new data source, I think, hey, this would be useful. Or some user says, you know, what about this? Just look at all the different ways that that data could be found, and then spin up a unique Lambda function that goes and collects the data puts it in sort of a canonical form that it drops into S3. And then there's later downstream, you know, this integration capability that picks that quasi-canonical form and then does one more step of kind of cleaning up, organizing it, and putting it into what is ultimately an integrated database with all the sources all keyed off of the service that they refer to. Okay. Um, so I want to sort of guess, uh, go back to that bit that you, you, uh, you talked about with the Twitter AWS wish list items. Um, how do you then feed back to the system to make sure that uh, you've tagged the right thing? Because obviously this is just people, you know, writing random stuff on on the internet. Uh, and uh, I mean, how do you make sure that uh, you're improving the the accuracy of uh, your techniques that you're using to tag those uh, services? Yeah. So interestingly, um, generally it's not been much of a problem. I take a fairly uh, conservative approach uh, that if something doesn't match, I will delay putting it into the database. It's one step before this, if you go way back in time, when I first did this, basically I had to just even create the first database, like what are all the AWS services, which is still a, a challenge because what someone defines as a service, you know, especially if you look at things like all the subservices of under IAM or SageMaker, you know, is that a service, a subservice or just a feature? It's hard to sometimes tell, but, um, and also surprise, not surprisingly, if you're Corey, you wouldn't be so surprised, but, you know, the naming of AWS services is, not only is it sometimes strange, but it's highly variable. So one of the things I did in the very first version was if I found a new name that wasn't in the database, I would go and add it to the database. And pretty quickly, I realized that, oh, I had things that were essentially different or essentially the same being named as different things. And so I figured that, anyway, so the way it works out now is the occurrence of that is not that frequent. So whenever I extract a name, if it can't find a match, by looking against all these techniques I have, then basically it kicks it out as an alert and requires me to actually inspect it and decide 
oh, is this actually one of several things? Is it an alias for an existing service? Is it in fact a new service? Or is it not, you know, just not really anything? And that doesn't happen that frequently. Um, there's a few times a week I need to look at that. And it's really interesting. And one of the things that happens is there is um, essentially a confidence score. And if the system thinks that, look, this is a new name, but it kind of looks like something I've seen before. So it basically says, this is a proposed alias. And so then all I need to do is say, is put my eyes on it and say, yes, that is an alias or, or no, it's not actually, that's a veritable new service. So then my database per service, um, I maintain a list of aliases. So anything I've seen that is a possible misspelling, changing spacing, punctuation, uh, you know, even with fuzzy matches, you can find things that still show up as new, even as much as you know the prefix, which is not a variable, right? Amazon and AWS prefix is as mysterious as, as why one service is named AWS or Amazon as they may be. Um, people have theories, uh, but you know, there is one correct answer, but out of AWS documentation is, you know, several times I have found where it's presented with both. And so if it shows up with a different prefix, but otherwise the service looks the same, that'll come through as a proposed alias. And I'll actually put it in the database as a valid alias once I've inspected it. So since you know, now I know. That's funny that uh, even the official documentations uh, uh, mix and match them. <laughs> I mean, certainly yeah. I do. Sometimes I use Amazon uh, DynamoDB. Sometimes I say AWS uh, DynamoDB, for example. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's, I would, say, I haven't done a statistical analysis on this, but um, I would say on average I have around twelve aliases for every single service, and that just comes from just the way it's presented in dis different data sources. And these are mostly Amazon data sources as opposed to something like Twitter or YouTube, although YouTube is, is Amazon produced usually as well. But so, uh, yeah, they, they come up in in many different ways. And in fact, when I'm blogging, one of the things I do is I. Of course, I always have Cloud Pegboard open, um, but I do have the search box open. And so every time I type a service name, I always just you know flip over to the tab with Cloud Pegboard, type the service name so I can see what the official spelling is, and then get the link for the product URL, you know, which is one of the things on my data sheet. So you know, it's not the worst <laughs> mistake in the world, but you know, I like to get it right. So because um, yeah, it's hard; it's impossible to remember. Um, so I guess I have heard a couple of uh, people told me that uh, when it's Amazon something, uh, it means that the service was built for Amazon.com and used internally before it gets uh, exposed publicly as a service on AWS. Uh, whereas AWS something, uh, that means that that's a service that's built for AWS. Is that uh, the same as uh, what you've heard, at least one of the... Uh, rumors uh, that you've heard. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the rumors. Another was, and I'm pr I'll probably get this flipped, but you know, things that are sort of, uh, I I'm not sure even what the right term would be because any term is, is overly loaded here, but, uh, but that's sort of more of an infrastructure capability would be Amazon. And when it's sort of more of a managed service and layered up, then it's AWS. Uh, but I, I, I spent like a half a day one day trying to like search this and read various blogs because I just want to know what's the answer. And the answer was that there seemed to be no consensus, at least externally visible. Um, and when people had arguments that seemed solid, I could find counterexamples. Now, maybe not a lot, but, you know, so I basically just said, look, I'm just going to assume it's, it's sort of best effort to kind of get, have it mean something, but don't try to make it mean something. And, you know. It, it kind of reminds me back to um, at, at Novartis, we generate IDs for everything, right? So every compound, antibody, gene, everything has a name and it's important to have them registered. It's really the basis of science is getting those IDs right. And it, it turns out one of the issues that we had was people trying to pick IDs that sort of were like vanity plates. And you know, so we eventually had rules that prevented us from generating random IDs that had anything that was other than random looking um, for certain situations. So just because it's either, it's sometimes good to say either it has no meaning or it does have some semantics associated with it, but being halfway in between is kind of tr uh, tricky. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so with the Cloud Pegboard, I've been using it for a while now. I do find it quite useful in terms of filtering out a lot of the, I guess, noise in the stream of information you get about AWS. Um, but what is your business model for Cloud Pegboard? Um, I mean, how do you, do you hope to make money out of it? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a million dollar question. Um, so really, this started off as a passion project. Um, 
I really just thought this should exist and got frustrated that it didn't. And so after, was it reInvent 2019, I was talking to a bunch of people and, and I was like, you know, yelling over the crowds and the sort of the loud, loud bars and everything and you know, lost my voice kind of talking about this with a bunch of people and just came back and said, look, I'm just going to do this. And so I'm an idiot entrepreneur that basically said, yeah, I'm building something because I think it's needed and I'll worry about monetization later, which a year and a half in, my wife's wondering when that later is going to be. Um, but, uh, you know, so I did try, I did charge for it at, at first, or I, after I got a, you know, some number of hundreds of users, I started to charge for it and, and people were paying for it, but not at the rate that I, that I would need to make money. I could see that, look, that's just not going to work. So I decided to keep it hundred percent free. And now I'm just kind of focused on making it useful and, and hopefully building a loyal user base that can expand. I mean, there's millions of people that could get value from it because it's really anyone's using AWS. It's really, you know, no matter what your role is, it's useful. So uh, really the model is to get a lot of happy users uh, and eventually hopefully move to a sp sponsorship model. Um, right now, I'm not doing that because I really want to you know, make sure that it's solid and, and really providing great value first. But, uh, but yeah, eventually, hopefully it'll be more of a sponsorship model. I think will probably work best. Um, you know, and there's also the side of it which is for enterprises, there's some additional features that I have. So like you can, again, this was an idea I had because I wanted this when I was at Novartis, but I haven't been able to sell the idea of basically extending the data model for enterprises, um, so, which to me is a little bit of a surprise because I would have bought it when I was on the other side. Um, but so for example, at, at Novartis, uh, we had internal governance procedures and had a wiki that listed every AWS service and had a link to the internal security guidelines for how you need to configure that service. We happen to use Turbot for some of our governance and management. And, you know, so there's always a question, did Turbot support the service yet? Because if it didn't, we weren't going to let people use it. We even had lists of internal experts and things. So we had a lot of this internal metadata that was related to each service. And I didn't want to manage my own catalog of AWS services. And so, you know, Cloud Pegboard has this catalog of all AWS services and basically any attribute you can think of that goes along with it. And so the idea for our enterprise version of this is that you can connect your internal enterprise data and extend the data model. And so for internal users, you can, when you're looking up, let's say, the CloudFormation syntax uh, or ARN syntax or, or links to product documentation using the data sheet, you would right then and there see all your company specific information you know, such as uh, security information, and that way people are much more likely to find it and use it. You know, in that model, then there'd be an enterprise play. Uh, but being really honest, uh, uh, I've maybe just because it's just me and it's hard to do enterprise sales or building product and doing lots of other things. But um, it hasn't stuck yet, so I'm hoping that maybe eventually that will. But you know, really, it's I think just trying to get access to as many people as possible, get them really, really happy, and then eventually um, you know, find ways to get some sponsorship. Yeah, starting a company is always hard, uh, which is uh, pretty much the, the reason why I haven't started mine. <laughs> uh, but I do wish you good luck. And I do think it's a, it's a very useful, uh, valuable service uh, to the community. I found it, uh, I found quite a lot of value out of it. And hopefully people that are listening today would uh, uh, sign up and uh, get some value out of it as well. And uh, maybe talk to their bosses or their bosses' bosses and get that uh, enterprise uh, ball rolling for you. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, that's great. I'm glad you're finding some value. And, and really, you know, this came from my, my passion because it's just one of those things like, I want this, no one's building it, so I'm just going to go ahead and build it. And, and so for me, you know, and I think eventually, you know, I, I started my first business long ago, which, you know, um, too, it's too far ago that it's uh, embarrassing, but, you know, it's an aviation weather service. And, uh, you know, so I, I guess I believe that uh, eventually it'll work out. And but mostly it's, I'm having fun. I mean, this is a, a blast and I'm just, I figure, you know, I'm, I'm the classic case of what not to do as an entrepreneur. You just build it because you think it's interesting. And, <laughs> um, but, you know, eventually it'll work out. And uh, I guess I should also mention one of the things I am doing is because I'm a builder, not a marketer at all. And so I am looking for a, uh, like a, a CMO like person to be a partner and someone who can actually likes and is capable in this stuff much more than I am. Okay, and uh, you also mentioned before the show that uh, you were working on something new, an adventure uh, to add to the mix. Um, do you want to tell us about that as well? Sure. Um, it's it's more of an extension than it is um, totally new in the sense that I've gone out and I interviewed an awful lot of people. I um, still want to do more, basically. 
uh, doing customer interviews, just trying to learn what people are doing, what some of the friction places are that all around this idea of gathering and managing information because, you know, AWS is just such a flood of information, and, and I should also, you know, and I'm also adding Azure support and such, so which makes it even more. And um, and you know, one of the things I was looking for is patterns there, and one of the things that seemed to stick out was the use of Slack, um, which I support. I had supported in a small way before, and, and really and use a lot myself. But I was surprised the extent to which people kept saying. Yeah, they they get the RSS feed, you know, or select number of them in their Slack, and and the problem with that is that everyone's do it independently, and there's like thirty different RSS feeds that are worth following. And again, this sort of you know, I have this motto like information architecture matters. Just getting all the information is really not really the the best thing to do. I, I'm trying to find ways to provide people with just the information that they need that's relevant to them in the way they want it and how they want it. Uh, and so, and that's what Cloud Pegboard does, you know, especially with these uh, nightly emails, uh, whether it's, whether you get them you know, daily or weekly, um, that you can specify just what information you want to get. And so I'm now moving that to Slack so that there's a Slack app where basically you can get all the feeds that I get, get pushed into a Slack feed that's personal to just you. So if you, um, you know, the app has its own sort of messages tab. Uh, and therefore, you can get just the information that you want. And like, and if you want to unwatch a service, you just unwatch the service. And again, it continues to be organized by service. Uh, and so you can decide, do you care about region updates? Do you care about governance changes? Do you want to know about AMI versions on the, you know, deep, you know, deep learning AMIs or, you know, and if you only care about serverless services. So you can basically configure dynamically if, if you want just what information is useful to you. And then also just, you know, even when you get it, like in the in the feed, you can say, look, only give it to me during these hours of a day so that you don't get that sort of distraction factor. And so it's tying into the same database as I have with all the same data collection, but I'm reporting it out via this uh, very highly customizable, personalized uh, Slack app. And then it also has some other really neat things, uh, which I find important. Uh, such as a reading list. So if you look at something, say, oh, yeah, that's really important. Um, but I really don't want to read it now. Uh, you can just add it to a reading list. And then there's a whole bunch of features around le- reading list management, uh, including the fact that thing, there's a priority reading list and a best effort reading list. And and you can expire, th- you set basically timers in. So like you'll expire something on the best effort reading list, which, you know, again, looking at sort of personal habits, uh, sometimes you put something and say, I should really read this. And then it sits there for six months. After a certain amount of time, you should probably just give up on it. And so I try to help with that by you know, making that a capability that you can say, you know, give it retention time and such. So anyway, I think that that's basically the idea is that there's this Slack app, which is um, really makes it a lot more accessible to get the information in the way that people want it based off what I've, what I've heard. And so uh, uh, that's... Uh, Getting well by the time this right airs, it'll be well in production. It's uh, but hopefully I'll have my first early adopters in uh, in a week. So I'm I'm pretty excited to play with it long enough myself. It's time to let someone else play. And uh, it was really fun to build this too. Actually, it was fun to build a Slack app and get some much uh, deeper use of EventBridge than I had in the past too. Okay, so you mentioned the event bridge there, uh, which should be of a trigger word, because uh, I do think it's a, it's a great service. So how are you using event bridge with uh, Slack in this case? Are you using the built-in the Slack integration? Um, no, actually, uh, that really doesn't quite, quite fit for, for what I'm doing. Uh, but the way the Slack API works, uh, well, one of the pieces of it, is it'll send you an event when certain things happen, well, when most things happen. So Slack events will come to me through API Gateway, and for most of these things, because obviously Slack's trying to protect the user experience, you got to respond really fast. And so basically, I have an event handler that's a Lambda function behind API Gateway that collects the information from Slack. If it has to do something, it basically responds with a 200 response and the appropriate you know, responses needed there. Sometimes it'll do a little bit of work, like if it has to pop up a modal, it'll actually go in and draw that modal. But most all other events, I just dump them off to EventBridge and fire and forget and say, I'll handle that later. Let me make sure to respond to Slack uh, quickly and efficiently. You know, some of these things have very short timeouts and I don't want to have any variability for data dips or anything else. So, And so once it's on the bus, then I have another 
Lambda function that subscribes to that, uh, several. Uh, and then they can do things. So, for example, there's the, I'm um, not sure how many people are familiar with the Home tab, but, uh, but for Slack apps, if you click on the app itself, it'll give you a screen where you have two tabs, the messages that are sort of the stream of messages from the app, as well as a Home tab. The Home tab is more of a uh, persistent static screen, but you can update it. And so what happens there is one of my functions is just responsible for managing the home tab. So it'll pick up an event off the bus and it can do whatever it needs to do. And it's sort of independent of time. I mean, obviously I'm trying to be as fast as I can, but you know, it'll go and dip DynamoDB and do some logic. And then it'll push the result uh, through essentially a, a callback URL back to Slack, which will then render that result on that home tab. You know, or potentially it might post a message in the, in the message stream and so forth. So, you know, so that's the simple version of it. There's other things that, you know, I have other activities that listen on for some state management, especially on the new user onboarding when things happen and you want to go and kick off. You know, for example, I want to auto subscribe someone to Cloud Pegboard because I use features of Cloud Pegboard to amplify the uh, Slack app because sometimes, you know, having a full web user interface is handy. Uh, and so, you know, I can hang different things off of there and just listen for these different events. And so I have multiple subscribers to the same event in some cases. Yeah, so it's a pretty simple use case. What I found is fantastic on forcing you to decouple. Like once, I, I think a great pattern and habit is to just simply decide to use EventBridge um, because that simple decision will then make the rest of the architecture flow in ways that you don't start doing some unnatural couplings, which, you know, because I certainly could do this without EventBridge. And then I certainly would be refactoring in two months um, or less. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of how I've been leveraging it. Okay, and I guess the one thing that I'll, I'll be probably quite interested in, in terms of a feature, would be, a, uh, for example, I've been, want, I've been waiting for some service to become available in my region. I mean, this probably doesn't happen quite as often with uh, you, you know, if you're based in the US East 1, but certainly in the, some of the European regions, uh, I've had cases where you know, we are waiting for a service to become available, and it'd be really great if we just get a Slack notification when, when it does become available. Um, so maybe that's something that uh, you know, could add quite a lot of value. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, that use case, uh, I mean, essentially Cloud Pegboard does that today, but not. Um, but basically if it's one of your services you're watching, um, but the specific way that you phrased it is something I've been wanting to do and haven't yet done, which is to say a specific watch, this service with this attribute. And so absolutely that, you know, I, again, these are the kind of feedback I'm always looking for because I have all the data, I have the, the output channel. It's just a pretty simple bit of making some rules and deciding what to do for these things. Um, and this all came back to, uh, again, when back to my days at Novartis, there are several places where uh, we're looking for capabilities that, um, you yeah, know, and we were on enterprise support contract. And so we got these spreadsheets from our TAMs and, uh, and we were looking at forecasts when things would come out. And, but, but sometimes you just get surprised. And, and, and so it's, you know, it was really important to find out when, whether something is appearing in a region or a new capability. So, you know, my canonical <laughs> example from way back when was for literally years, I was waiting for API gateway to have a VPC endpoint. Um, and I talked with the highest levels of people. I even had a conversation with Mike Clavel about this thing. And, and, but no, no matter how much gnashing of teeth there was, it just didn't happen for the longest time. And, and it was almost like a joke that I kept asking for, when's this coming, when's this coming? And, you know, so that's one of those things where you know, we were totally blocked uh, until we actually got that capability. And I think that's the case, you know, again, like you say, uh, for certain regions, um, you know, seeing the flow as they come out. And it's kind of interesting looking at South Africa and um, Milan and, 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 you know, as you know, some of the newer regions, you can sort of see this flow as features start trickling into them over the last, you know, four months or so. Okay, very cool. And since uh, you are working, you're, you're, picking, you're picking data from the Twitter about people's uh, AWS wishlist items, uh, uh, what are your top three AWS wishlist items? Oh, I got a limit to three, huh? <laughs> um, I think <laughs> you can you can offer more if you want. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I have a lot of like sort of really actually fairly minor things, but I think would be small but really impactful. Um, but at the sort of the top level, there's uh, I have this what I think is this really beautiful architecture um, that is completely serverless. Uh, it's what I call uh, disaster tolerant, um, you know, so essentially fault tolerant across regions. You know, so I used uh, global tables for DynamoDB. 
uh, origin failover for S3 and as well as, you know, along with uh, S3 replication. And so everything is, is beautiful and just feels good. It's a nice architecture. And again, it, it's active active. So if anything really, really bad happens, I don't even have to be involved. There's no DR plan really because it just, it's active active. Except, <laughs> except the Achilles heel is Cognito. Um, I use Cognito user pools. And near as I know, there's still no replication or backup restore capability that will preserve you know, passwords. And so you know, I, could, I can back up the, you know, all the data and restore it. But if I have a failover event, uh, if, you know, if user pools in, in US East 1, let's say, goes down, I have a choice of either waiting it out, probably going to work in most cases. But you know, again, if you think about the control abstract uh, you know, the way, you know, or I, if I, what today, what I have to do is I actually have to declare an event to myself right, and say, okay, I'm now going to activate and point everything to my US West 2 user pool and force every user to go through a password reset process because I can't, I can't migrate the password. So this, I, I guess I'm frankly a little surprised that it's lasted this long without it, but really I think replication of, you know, just like we do with uh, global tables, which is an amazing feature in DynamoDB, which took a while to get, but once we got it, it's really extremely powerful. I really just want the same kind of capability uh, in Cognito. And if I'm asking, then, you know, um, you know, backup restore as part of AWS backup uh, would all kind of fit and tie that picture together. So that's probably my number one. Number two, I think, is um, a little bit more of a nicer to have than, than the previous one, but I, I think it would be great to have essentially an auto-tuning suggestion for uh, Lambda uh, set, settings of memory and, and maybe even timeout that would help. Uh, so conceptually, if uh, like Alex Casabani's uh, Lambda power tuning tool, but there's really no reason that Amazon can't just build this right into the product. Um, and you know, what I'd like to be able to do is say, Give some bounds of of memory and timeouts that are uh, acceptable to to the function, you know, and that's actually running in, in production. Maybe give a lambda uh, a hint to say how much of my sampling can you do? Can you perturb a hundred percent or five percent of my invocations to try some of these different options and then log them in the report statement or in an additional statement, which of course then I could trigger off of for alerts and, and other things, uh, and then. Either you know, in sort of a champion challenger sort of way, tell me which should be the winner, or actually just go ahead and make it the winner and converge over time when when the service has got enough evidence to say, look, this is actually given your criteria of you're looking for, you know, cost or speed, you know, whatever it may be. Once you've so optimized on on that objective function, then actually make that to be the the winner, and then maybe challenge it again. And so it's kind of like. Um, you know, just like I think the difference how you know on-demand billing for DynamoDB was was really real super powerful. It'd be good to have that for Lambda functions. And one of the things I do today, because when you're small and starting up a new capability, you know, I typically will put a fairly significant timeout and maybe a gig of, of RAM, and figure that's fine because I'm only running it you know a few times. And then eventually it goes to production. You leave it there, and then maybe six months later you realize, oh, I probably should have gone back and looked at it. And that. And, and brought that down to you know, 256 is really all it needs. And you know, to have to go and look at that, I certainly it's not the hardest thing in the world and I could run Lambda power tuning or do other things, but that's effort. Like, I'm trying to keep this sort of maintenance free thing. And, and there's no reason why we couldn't just have the service optionally just converge to a, a more optimal setting. That I think would just, it seems kind of an obvious thing to build and I'd love to see that. And since I get my three genie wishes, uh, um, okay, I guess I can wish them. doesn't mean I get them, huh? Um, but Something I've, I've kind of wished to have is the popular Python packages uh, to just be available as layers. Um, you know, there's some, AWS has like a handful uh, that are out there. You can just, you know, pick the ARN and, and, and go to town. Uh, there is you know, another listing of, of some published uh, layers, but you know, I think it's important to have the layers published by AWS so that they're secure and trusted and maintained. Um, and I know there's a really long tail but there's also a pretty significant head, you know, like I have a layer for requests. Like I shouldn't have to have a layer for requests. It'd be nice to just to point to an ARN and use that in, in Bodo 3 and NumPy or, you know, there's just so many things that, that it would be great to have as just layers. Again, all to reduce the friction and just make it much more of this. You can just kind of plug and play with pieces. 
um, that's just one more thing that I think would be really handy. Thank you. Those are some of the best uh, AWS uh, wishlist items that I've heard. Uh, certainly the one about uh, Cognito is surprising for me as well. I've had that question from customers a few times. Uh, is uh, well, we want to do this multi-region thing. Everything seems fine apart from Cognito. How do people do it? <laughs> and unfortunately, the answer has always been, well, no one does it because it's just really difficult to do and just impractical. Um, but I do wish uh, they have better support for exporting uh, users. Like I said, every time uh, you want to change some kind of, um, or change your user management system, or even just migrate from one port to another, is a giant pain in the ass. As for the power tuning, I think that's a that's a, that's a very interesting idea. I've actually had the I saw someone uh, do something kind of clever, where by the function itself can actually do some kind of uh, uh, I guess meta programming to change its own configuration. In this particular case, uh, I think he was changing maybe not a memory but a timeout. So when it, uh, when the function itself sees that uh, oh well, it's taking longer and longer to process things, uh, it, it adapts by increasing its own timeout. Or I've actually written some functions in the past whereby we change the uh, kinesis batch size to to adapt to the fact that well uh, we are just not processing things fast enough, uh, and uh, our downstream system is taking too long to respond, and all of that. You know, we we adapt by changing the batch size uh, of the kinesis function. So potentially that's something that you can roll yourself uh, for now, but certainly that's way more complexity than it's worth. I, don't, I think, yeah, if it's something that Amazon can just provide out of the box as like auto tuning. Exactly. Again, because you know everybody could do this, but then but a classic sort of undifferentiated heavy lifting, and because it's really the same function, you don't have to know too much. I mean, I think the metaprogramming example of of, of hitting your upstream service, that's something where you really want to do yourself. And, and that's actually a very cool use case. I, I, mean, I think that's really neat. Um, and in fact, you could write, uh, this doesn't have to be built into a a Amazon. We, you know, you could write a, a Lambda function that just, you know, sits there, you know, sucking up CloudWatch logs, uh, log events, you know, and then having access to go and, and tweak the parameters of your Lambda function. But again, you could, but doesn't mean you should, and and that's kind of why we use AWS is because you know, I, I want them to do everything that's not business logic, basically. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, also, I guess I would say that uh, for most of like I told you, I've seen Lambda cost is probably never significant enough to warrant too much effort. Uh, so most of the optimization in terms of cost has gone into other things like um, API Gateway or even CloudWatch logs, which often uh, cost a lot more than the Lambda invocations themselves. Yeah, exactly. And and so and that's you know, one of the things, if it doesn't cost a lot of pain, then it's not going to, it's harder to prioritize it. Um, but for, for me, one of the things though is because in some cases, like I will be really generous on memory um, to the point that it's, you know, it's a 10x factor. Um, and today that's still not bothering me too much because you know, I just don't have that scale of user. But I know that over time, you know, I'm hoping, you know, to go up by a factor of a thousand. You know, again, if you think about, you know, 100 milliseconds, so in every second, there's 10 of those and then then 10 more seconds of that. If, and so, you know, I've done some, some of my functions I've occasionally, you know, profiled. And I always find it fascinating that, yeah, there's a definite sweet spot here. And it's, and I really do find a lot of value. And there's one time where I actually got value in two gigs, which was rare, but um, yeah. So yeah, I agree that it's, it's a low cost, but, but sometimes I'm trying to essentially optimize some performance without way overdoing the cost by, you know, because sometimes it's hard to tell at the beginning and then you kind of, you forget. And if it's not important, you're not ever going to go back. Um, so if uh, you're happy to work with a compromise, I wrote a blog post a while back about how you can use uh, Alex uh, Power Tuning 2 as part of your CI CD pipeline so that uh, you do it uh, essentially with every deployment. Uh, you work out, are uh, you still running on the, uh, against your sweet spot rather than having to do it manually from time to time? Yeah, yeah. And that's actually a great idea. Um, and there are places which is probably poor design, not probably, is <laughs> poor design, where that doesn't work for me just because things aren't quite as item potent as you want them to be. And things are, you know, I'm dealing with some variable data. So for example, I am doing a certain amount of processing on a per user basis. And based off what you know, someone could be watching 300 different services and someone could be watching four services. You know, so the the amount of information that I process, you know, whether it's on a, on a Slack update or on an email update, 
uh, can be highly variable. And so that's why I, I kind of like the idea of, of running against actual production data, whereas you know any kind of sort of quasi-static analysis in, in the CI/CD pipeline doesn't have that now. Could I build test cases that kind of figure out my usage patterns? Absolutely, um, but I haven't. All right, uh, so this has been fun. Before we go, how can people find you on the internet? Well, uh, Twitter, I'm at Cloud Pegboard, which is <laughs> really just me, um, and DMs are open. Uh, LinkedIn, Ken Robbins, and it's two Bs, uh, and probably just add Cloud Pegboard into the search term to dis disambiguate me. Uh, I blog on Medium, and, um, and of course, cloudpegboard.com is the site. Excellent. And uh, so if uh, you are using AWS and you're struggling with the constant stream of uh, information about uh, what's happening and you want to just focus on a few things, then to check out the uh, Cloud Pegboard. Personally, I've been using it for a while and I do find it quite useful. So yeah, Ken, thank you so much again for taking the time to talk to us uh, today. Uh, stay safe and uh, stay well. Well, fantastic. Uh, same to you. I really, this was a ton of fun. I learned something as well. So this is uh, great. I really appreciate this. All right, man. Take care. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that's it for another episode of Real World Serverless. To access the show notes, please go to realworldserverless.com. If you want to learn how to build production-ready serverless applications, please check out my upcoming courses at productionreadyserverless.com. And I'll see you guys next time.